<laughs> so no, okay, so we can skip already to the second slide, Natalie. Already losing a couple of minutes. So as I said, this is going to be a 30 minute talk. I decided that 30 minutes would be quite a bit um, of time. So I'll do a 20 minute presentation. I'll see perhaps if we can even go a little bit faster than that. And then for the last 10 minutes, it would be fantastic if we had some Q&A and discussion. So I proposed a couple of discussion questions here, essentially how to ensure dissemination and application of the guidelines, sustainability beyond the project and, and next steps. So I'll just jump into the presentation. Next slide, Natalie. So what we set out to achieve. So also just uh, for a reminder, and those of you who just joined, I'm letting some of you in as we go along. This is about the regional communications guidelines. This was the very last deliverable to my knowledge. This Rita and I delivered for the end of December. And what we're talking about is two sets, two distinct documents, about 40 pages each, regional communication guidelines for Latin America and African countries. The goal of both of these documents, which are very similar in scope, was to provide a roadmap to facilitate communications, uh, increase awareness of research infrastructures, and further drive collaboration with stakeholders. So here we define our stakeholders as scientists, research organizations, research networks, etc. in two of the three RIVs regions, Latin America and Africa. This decision was made by the project management team and those who amended the project. But this was also in line with the chronological order of the symposium and that uh, we had Africa and Latin America, Australia took place uh, at the end, so it was just to build off of those two first events. The guidelines are designed to help the RI communications officers, but in addition, the RI managers, this is the important point that I wanted to stress it's not just for communicators, and I think this is ultimately the takeaway that we had from the project, there are a lot of lessons learned across the board throughout the survey process and the feedback we got from the respondents that apply really to all RI staff, in particular, the directors who are seeking to develop international strategies and collaboration in these regions. So that's why I said it's relevant to staff to create their own communication strategies and to consider factors that could help or hinder them in communicating effectively with these different groups. It is not intended to be a directory or a contact, contact list. For Latin America, that's the one we developed first. Um, we had more detailed information country by country in the appendix. We just realized this was going to be unmanageable for Africa or African countries, particularly because we, we focused specifically on a region, English speaking countries in particular. So we just wanted to provide lessons learned, um, general insights, rather than having a country by country contact database, who to contact, you know, where to publish your information and so on. Uh, next slide, Natalie. So the task leaders, as I mentioned, it was myself. I'm from EMBRC HQ and Rita, as you know, from CCMAR, she presented earlier. That's EMBRC Portugal. So it was an EMBRC activity. The starting point was the infamous RIVs Communications Toolkit and the three white papers, as well as the outputs of the symposia in Latin America and Africa. The approach we decided to take after discussion was to develop a survey this was also a very COVID friendly type format because we couldn't get together with other stakeholders to discuss. We thought a survey would be a good way to get information that we would then be able to apply to the guidelines. So the idea was to compile information from local stakeholders in particular, as well as individuals with in-depth knowledge of the regions. And here I say more to come. I'm going to talk a bit more about the survey on the next couple of slides. We also decided to create two separate organizing committees. So we had one per region, one for Latin America, one for Africa. And the idea here was to oversee the survey development, to provide feedback on the phrasing of the questions, the type of information we were looking for, to disseminate, very importantly, to help with the information analysis, and then to support the guideline validation. So next slide. The organizing committees. So we shaped each of the committees the same way. Reed and I were on both of them. And we decided to have one senior RI representative on each as well as a local representative. So for Latin America, that's when we got started with. We had uh, Rita's director, the director of CCMAR, um, EMBRC Portugal partner. And he had a contact, Andres Lopez Lara, head of equipment and infrastructure development, um, national contact point research infrastructures, He's uh, working with the Chilean governments. Since he collaborated with us, his title changed. And I know that's a long one. Um, and for Africa, we had Bane, who uh, you heard from earlier, um, instrumental role in this project. 
And Daniel Adams, that contact was thanks to Bonnie. I don't know if Daniel's on, I saw him earlier, but he was highly involved in the symposium um, for Africa. And so that was natural contact for us. Um, now, what role did the organizing committees play? As I explained, they had an instrumental role in providing a local perspective. That was very important for us to have that local perspective, highlighted any issues with the survey. And here, where they played an essential role was getting the respondents to fill out the survey. I would say this is where um, Rita and I uh, struggled ourselves because we don't necessarily have the contacts in the field. So that was where they played a very key role in getting the survey out, sending reminders, and getting the surveys to be filled out and sending the data to us. All right, next slide, Natalie. So the survey, and, and feel free to chime in or ask questions as I go along. I know this is sort of a text heavy presentation, short on visuals, apologies. So if you have any comments or questions, just you know, um, raise your virtual hand and, and I'll let you chime in. So the survey, the aim of it was to assess existing awareness and understanding of our eyes, as well as trying to identify the main interests and goals of local stakeholders and the main constraints in terms of engaging with our eyes. We identified four different groups um, for the survey respondents, individual scientists, research organizations and institutions, research networks and associations and government entities. We also invited uh, stakeholders from industry to participate, but they ended up being a minority. Our goal when we sent out the survey was approximately to have 20 respondents. We ended up having a few more for Latin America and a bit more for African countries. But for both cases, we ended up having the amount of data that we thought would be helpful to de develop the guidelines. So we had a combination of open-ended questions and tick box or drop down options with set options. Both of the surveys, they're almost identical. We just changed the wording. Um, they were both developed in English and adapted to the region. So we made some slight changes. We, so we started with the Latin American survey and based on lessons learned and during the data analysis, Reed and I um, realized that maybe perhaps some of the wording was ambiguous. Um, perhaps there was a bit of redundancy. So we just incorporated those changes into the African survey. I put the links up here. I think that Natalie might disseminate this after the presentation. The Latin American survey is still online. We closed the African survey, so you can't actually um, see the survey online, but please feel free to check out the Latin American survey, which is still online. Next slide. So the survey results, what did we end up getting? So I'll start with Latin America. Uh, our targets, when we disseminated the survey, they were, first of all, the contributors to the RIV's white paper um, and individuals recommended by the organizing committee, particularly by our local stakeholder on the organizing committee, Andres Lopez Lara. In terms of country distribution, um, quite a focus on Nicaragua. We're, we're not quite sure how that happened uh, since Andres was based in Chile, but that ultimately ended up being the predominant respondent country. We had 26 re responses. Something worth noting is the survey was in English. Most of our responses were in English, but we did get some survey responses in Spanish. And that's actually an important point in terms of um, catering to local linguistic needs or expectations that we highlighted in the survey. The majority of respondents were researchers, about 11 of them, or academics, uh, policymakers, decision makers, some RI managers or individuals who are identified as such, and two stakeholders from industry and others who didn't necessarily identify with those categories. Um, that doesn't necessarily add up to 26. Some people tick more than one box, um, identifying with more than one role at once. So next slide, please. Now for African countries, target the same approach as for Latin America. So we were first focusing on the white paper respondents. In any context, we had participants from the symposium. In terms of country di distribution, we got a bit more diversity, but also highly focused on English speaking countries. And you'll see there was um, a majority of respondents from South Africa. That's also naturally the reason because Danny or Daniel Adams disseminated the surveys. And so I can imagine that's many of his peers, coworkers, colleagues, like minded institutions within the country. Um, Danny, if I didn't mention this, works in South Africa, uh, but I'm sure you heard this earlier if you were present for the rest of the, the, the morning sessions. So in all, we had 22 responses, similar composition, um, high level scientists, directors who identified as unit directors, chief directors, head of department, uh, so very much academic or university positions, working in research centers or academic institutions. 
Um, oh, here, you know, I had identified this, but I think in retrospect, this might not be the case. I said one particular of this group, we had some European respondents with in-depth knowledge of the region. We had a few non-African country respondents, individuals residing in Belgium, um, in particular two, but I looked at the profile of one of them and she was actually originally from South Africa. But that was perhaps the difference I had noted um, in relation to the Latin American respondents that we did have some who aren't currently residing or European individuals who are now working and residing in different African countries. So that was just the slight difference in terms of respondents. Next slide. So our main takeaways, and I'll try to go quickly so we have enough time for discussion. Uh, main interests and goal. Now, I don't distinguish between the regions because we felt as if these were quite similar for both geographic regions. The um, themes that really came out were a strong desire for collaborative approaches. I think we went into this, you know, also asking, would you be interested in using EURI services, potentially inviting them to be um, users, you know, similar to our European users, but we felt as if the, the responses were really in line with a desire for collaboration, joint projects, um, emphasis on collaboration also in project design and leadership. So here I noted we'd be aware of top down approaches. It might not even be the top down approaches. It could also be the nuance in our approach, the way in which we approach stakeholders in the regions. So that was one of the important takeaways is to be aware of, you know, how we might come across in approaching these groups. Um, and Rita, feel free to jump in. But one thing that struck me when we sent out the survey to, La to African countries is there was a comment on the word engaging. Um, and someone had interpreted it as sort of, you know, top down, we're going to engage, we're going to take something away from you. And we didn't see the word like that. So that's why I think later on in the presentation, I said we need to be really focused on cultural sensitivity, nuance, um, not only the words that are tricky for us, defining our eyes and access, but other words, um, you know, engaging with someone that might carry a very different meaning to different types of stakeholders. So just to be aware of that, and one of the takeaways there is just to be very clear, and this is very in line with the toolkit, be very clear in your definitions and your terms and try to be simplistic and don't assume that uh, words that we might take for granted have a universal meaning in all regions and among all RI stakeholders, even among the EU RI stakeholders. So other um, themes that came out in the survey responses, knowledge sharing, capacity building, um, strong interest in training, um, staff exchanges, science diplomacy. This was a phrase that came out, especially among the African respondents, internationalization of research and publications. So there was an interest there in gaining visibility from collaboration with our eyes and sort of getting up there in the international stage. An interest of um, perhaps, of course, I say of course, but um, in gaining access to the EURI, what they deem the state of the art equipment and services in Europe. And again, but not necessarily paying full market cost for those EURI services given financial constraints. Not to say that some countries in the regions we looked at wouldn't have the funding to access those. Next slide, Natalie, please. Main takeaways the, fun the constraints funding. That was a, a one that came up all over the place for the Latin American respondents. The takeaway there I felt was that they just don't have funding to use our services like a regular user. So that's why it would be of interest to look for available regional funding sources, European funding sources, and really also to provide information if you're looking to do international collaboration, how can we finance this? if they don't already have that information available. Potential linguistic barriers that could apply to all regions. I mentioned the Latin American respondents in particular respond in Spanish. This could have been the case. Um, it just so happened that our African country respondents um, were all focused in English speaking countries, I think with the exception of one. So we got all those answers in English, but this is something to keep in mind, regardless of the region. Um, I know in Europe, it's you know conventional to communicate in English, but you know it might not be the case in all regions. Um, difficulty knowing how to reach out to EU RI stakeholders. So we also, one thing to say is we didn't just focus on one way interaction communication, the EU's re EU RI is reaching out to the regional stakeholders. We also thought of what can make it easier for them to reach out to us. Um, so this inspired our two pronged approach, which Rita here, Rita was behind this sort of structuring in this phrasing. So thank you, Rita, which we refer to as an active and a passive strategy, active being where whereby we reach out um, to the stakeholders ourselves and passive being we provide them with information on our website or social media tools so that they can find it for themselves and then reach out to us. 
Next slide, please. So the guidelines, a quick overview, we structured it like a roadmap to create a communication strategy. So this is why, you know, it's still catered to um, a communicator's role to an EU communications officer or a manager. Um, hence this sort of step-by-step -step approach. Essentially, you know, the guidelines are how can you create a context appropriate communication strategy for each of these regions. So step one, do your homework. This is sort of the no brainer, but you might not necessarily think to do all of this background um, homework. So not only to, to read you know, the background information that comes out from this project, the white papers, the toolkit, but also to identify existing collaboration with other RIs that might have occurred since the publication of these resources and perhaps to read literature to better understand the national and regional policies or politics and see how your eye can fit in to see how your value proposition can really respond to the local needs. That's something that really came out with the African countries. You know, don't just sweep in and say that you have this offer and you'd like to do this collaboration, but how is this going to serve the country's needs? Um, what will be the, the value for this for the local institutions and local people? Step two, identify your goals. Um, here I say align your communications goals with business goals, be clear in your expectations, and keep in mind your targets goals. So the targets goals, the targets would be your um, the regional stakeholders. And you know, they might not necessarily be aligned with yours. So here this is why we say to adapt as needed. So based on discussion and perhaps initial collaboration or experience, you might want to take a step back and say, you know, evaluate perhaps our goals were not in line. Let's take a look and restructure. And the next slide. Step three, identify and get to know your target audiences. So this is very much in line with what Rita and I explored in the training series. We want to sort of personify our targets, get to know them, understand their needs, um, and then really cater to cater our messaging to those target audiences. Here I say to consider primary and secondary. Um, you know, that's just communications phrasing. Primary are the main people we want to reach, but secondary. Those are people we don't necessarily want to communicate to, but they might be an appropriate means to get to our primary target. You know, that might be some individual in the communications office or an individual at a ministry that will help you get in touch with your primary target. Um, this is not necessarily uh, COVID friendly, but consider in-person events. This came up for the African respondents in particular to have perhaps these focus groups, these community workshops where you can sit down and talk with your actual targets to understand them better, their needs, and how your projects can be developed collaboratively to meet those needs. Next slide. Step four, develop your key messages. Um, here I talked about difference in understanding and nuance, so keep that in mind. This is where the toolkit can be really helpful. Develop messages to grab their attention, focusing on those the, um, the target's main desires and interests, so knowledge sharing, collaboration, science diplomacy, et cetera. Keep in mind the differing meetings. And here I mentioned this before, be aware of your cultural baggage. You might not be aware. I know as a, an American living in France, I might see things in my own particular perspective. That's something to keep in mind when you're collaborating with different cultures and different regions, they might not share that perspective. So just be aware of that. Uh, next slide. Develop your key messages. Sorry, this is the second point. Oh, also, this is something that came up particularly for the African survey. Be clear on the proposed business model and participation requirements. Um, perhaps if you have a flexible paying model, if there's a cost of being part of a consortium, this is something that Daniel Adams mentioned in particular to make that very clear. Um, you know, what are the terms of collaborating with the EURI? What's it going to cost? What's our particip participation? And are there different levels of participation? And what will the benefits be? of those differing levels. Next slide. I'm going over time. I know Rita's saying this to herself. This is my problem. I'm always over time. <laughs> Step five. So identify relevant activities, tools, and channels. COVID can't even get me to talk less. I can't stop. Um, so here's a very important point is to make it easy to find relevant information on your website. So we had proposed having an actual section or a tab, you know, for international users, and you would have all the information how to access us, how to use us, what kind of projects are we interested in developing with rich uh, regions, you might even considering having part of that section in the target language. Um, also to be aware of websites and blogs in those regions that target those stakeholders. 
and use social media intelligently to tag um, local thought leaders and open accounts. You might think of creating a local mailing list just for international collaboration with stakeholders in a specific country or specific region. So you're really targeting. Um, and also work with local press and media. What could be helpful for that is also collaborating with local ministries. Sometimes they have a press office or within um, large research institutions, they might also have a press office. So see those tools as your allies to develop local press strategies. Step six, evaluation. So this is where I said, you know, you might um, in your plan say three months in, we're gonna take a step back, look how it's going and reevaluate. That's important in any communication strategy. Okay, I'm done with my steps, we can move on. <laughs> Next slide. Okay, food for thought, the conclusions. So this is the main point I start out by saying is these guidelines may be helpful for the development of an RI's international strategy. Um, so not just for communicators, this could be of interest to the RI directors, managers, and other key um, RI staff. Um, we also highlight the need for a holistic approach, considering short, medium, and long-term goals for your RI and local partners. You know, and also asking why do we want to target these groups to have that in mind to be able to answer if that questions even asked um, just to think strategically as well. And how will these goals contribute to their regional development meet their local needs, how will it contribute to meeting our EURI goals as well. Um, and then funding. So I'm admitting people from the waiting room as I go. Um, so funding, this is something I touched on. Some countries may have national and regional funding mechanisms. Um, some may expect the RI to come with funding. What we saw in the African survey in particular, some people pointed the, to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in particular as a potential source of funding. So you can keep those international sources in mind as well. Um, and next slide. Discussion. So with the five minutes remaining, I just want to ask you, so what are your thoughts? If you have questions for me, you can um, ask those as well, or Rita, who's here. Um, but the discussion questions I want to bring to the group are how to ensure dissemination application of the guidelines, what um, as RI stakeholders and partners can you do as well to help us disseminate these. They're also on Zenodo. So here I gave you the links to both documents. Thank you, Natalie, for putting those up. Um, and sustainability beyond project and if you have any insights on what we can do um, to ensure the, the sustainability of the guidelines. Okay, so I'll take it over to the group. Questions, comments? I have a comment, Sabrina, if I may. Sure, please. Oh, and one thing, and thank you, Claudia. Claudia was uh, very helpful. It was actually her idea to have the organizing committees. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Claudia. Um, when we think of research infrastructures, we always think in the big equipment and the building and all of that part. But a big part of our research infrastructure are the people. And in particular, we are a very international lot around research infrastructures. And I think a tip is to think who is in your infrastructure, because if you have people from the countries you are trying to reach, that will help you and, and and in our infrastructures you know we have Vidi and she's from Mexico and then why try to to contact them without if we have a Mexican that can actually help us with our interaction and in general remember that your infrastructure people are also your assets in in many ways and can help you with that then that's that's um that's that's a thought um the, the other thought is no, never lose uh, sight of the limitation of the people, you, uh, of the, no of the people, of the economical limitation of the, of the situation. I, I was just following a, a Twitter line about the APC, the article processing charges, for example and talking about acronyms and things that don't make sense, APC are for people in Europe and the US, very simple things. They just charge from their, from their grants. In some, of, in, some, in some developing countries, the APC may be 50% of their whole grant for five years for one paper. And all those, this is just an example of all the situations that can be very different from one region to another. And you need always to, 
to keep in mind when interacting. But just those, those two tips, don't forget your people. Look who is in your office. You may have somebody from the country you are trying to reach already. And, and don't forget the situations are very different from one region to another when communicating. Those are what my two cents. Great, thanks so much, Claudia. Yes, people are your assets. Anyone else have a question, comment? Thoughts on sustainability, dissemination? Rita, any last words? <laughs> I just like to say that it, it was a pleasure to do this, these guidelines. We learned a lot from our participants. They, those who participated in, in, in the survey, they were co-authors um, or participating authors in, in the study. We want to thank them. And, and this is, we, we, although we, did, we didn't do a contact list, there's a lot of um, useful resources that you can go and check on the appendix of the regional guidelines. So there's a base there to start. It won't be uh, the same in a few years time. So we know it's going to be outdated, but, it, but still it's a very good and useful resource. If you want to go to Africa and Latin America and develop collaboration at this point. So if you have any questions. Susan? Um, yeah, I just wanted to, to say there will be a panel session a little bit later on this afternoon where we have the opportunity to, to discuss this a little bit more. Um, but I, I think communication is, is um, the key thing uh, here. It's the, it's the central requirement to establish uh, partnerships initially and then to develop them further into something long lived and tangible. Um, and, and so, you know, one of the things that maybe we could discuss in the panel is, is from each of the regions that participated in our symposia, um, what do they think would be most effective in, in establishing these contacts? From their point of view, um, what, what would work the best and where are the limitations from their point of view so that we can, you know, it's, we've, we've thought about it a lot from, from the European side, but it would be good at this opportunity, having had the symposia and the experience of those to also get current feedback from the regions about uh, how well that worked and, and what could be done differently next time, what were the strong points, what not so good, and especially how we can translate that into a longer term plan. Great, thank you, Susan. I know we're out of time, Natalie, so perhaps we have to conclude it here. I see that Daniel Adams is online. I just wanted to give him a huge thank you. Uh, Bonnie as well, the other members of the organizing committee. I don't think Adelina is here now and our other member from Latin America, but a huge thanks. We couldn't have done it without our organizing committee members who played a really crucial role, not only in survey development, dissemination, and also rereading several drafts. Um, one thing that I'm not very good at is being succinct, apparently. <laughs> Rita and I thought we would do this in five to 10 pages, but to do justice to it, it ended up being two 40 page documents. So they are quite lengthy. Um, so anyway, thank you for bearing with me, my organizing committees. Thank you to the project management team for all your support, Natalie and Claudia and others as well. We're very helpful in sort of designing our methodology and supporting us in dissemination as well. So thank you everyone. <laughs>